This is Stacy Marshall with Printware Magazine. Matt Vasallo with the RhinestoneWorld.com. Richard Greaves with ScreenMaking.com. Brian Walker with RTP Apparel. You are listening to the Two Regular Guys Podcast. 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 Hosted by Terry Combs. Terry Combs. Terry Combs. And Aaron Montgomery. Aaron Montgomery. Aaron Montgomery. Keep on listening. I don't know if these guys are or that regular. All right. Welcome to the show. It is Friday, April 9th. I'm Aaron Montgomery, and you can find me over at Our Success Group. And I am Eric Campbell sitting in for Terry Combs, and you can find me at ericcampbell.com. But today, more importantly, we'll be talking with Jeremy Picker, the creative director and CEO at Amber Creative, to discuss expanding beyond basic local reproduction through creative design and use of materials. And uh, if I'm on camera, you know what's probably happened is that embroidery content's coming. Um, <laughs> so so uh, I, I do promise there's other content. Uh, Jeremy is super inspirational in a lot of ways, so I want you guys to all be here for it. But yeah, I, I hope you enjoy the little take-up takeover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we had to give Terry some time off. He's that poor guy. We just work him so hard. We, we ask him to show up every week and smile. So I mean, it's, it's so tough. hard. It's hard being <laughs> yeah. a talent and sitting next to that pool in Arizona with all that sunshine coming down. I think it, it really is yeah. killing him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, this is going to be great. I'm excited because I actually also get to get out of the way here and, and let you guys really kind of dig in and and bring some inspiration. Jeremy was already showing us some some images that we're going to be able to show you guys. And uh, man, this is uh, just ready. be ready to be inspired. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, and, and I get to push the buttons today. So let me push some buttons here, Eric. Let's, let's check in with some of our regulators let's first do it, before man. we do that. Uh, we've got Gusta checking in from Sweden. I and Chris, Christine, good morning. And uh, Christine, Katie, good morning from Texas. Mm. Um, good morning, Kevin and Jeff. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Christine says, so the half is an, uh, yeah, no, that'll still happen. So no, no we're, time we're still doing tonight. the half. Don't worry about the half. And, and also I promise I'm going to return your guys. I'm not just, <laughs> I'm not going to take over all the airwaves every Friday. That's not, I'm not planning on that. I don't think I'll survive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Take up, take over reciprocators unite. Oh boy. Look out. Um, oh man, you're in for it. <laughs> and uh, Todd says too many T's Terry taking time off for take up, takeover. Okay. Dude, all right, gonna... Aaron, well done. Well done for not tripping on that one. That was, that was well worth it. Thank you. Thank you. We've got Dale checking in from Portland, Oregon. Good morning, everybody. Thank you guys so much yes. for being here. This is going to be for fantastic. In. Um, in fact, I want to get out of the way as soon as possible because uh, Jeremy just sent us another link of more inspiration. So uh, boy, we've got tons of great stuff coming at you. But before we do that, before I get out of the way here, Eric, um, if you guys didn't get a chance to hear our recent podcast a few weeks back uh, that we had with uh, Jim Raffle and Ray Weiss about getting right color with DTG and sublimation, um, after that podcast, we actually had an opportunity to then go join Jim and his partner, Shelby, on their new podcast called The Die Subcast. And um, it was really fun. Terry and I got to get over there and chat about history of, of the show, Dice Sublimation, what's going on in the world. It, and it, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. So if you want to check that out, it's dicebcast.com. And uh, Eric is getting the actual bit.ly link up so you can go directly to our episode if you'd like to check that out. So we, we had a blast. We'd, we'd encourage you guys to go check that out. Um, all right. So Eric, <laughs> because you're here on screen, that does yes. mean that you are required to bring the dad joke to the table here. So. Well, you know, I can't help it because I think I like to com compete with Terry a little bit. You know, he likes to come up with the smart dad jokes and I, I love doing these. So, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. Whenever I have to talk about the dad joke, everybody's like, oh man, all these puns, it's, it's killing me. Why do you guys always do these puns? And I'd say really, you know, it's hard to explain puns to certain people. And really the top problem I have is this. Uh, it's hard to explain puns to kleptomaniacs because they always take things literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh my take goodness things. oh take boy <laughs> oh, all right yeah so we love eric because he's super smart and um yeah he's awesome. I, I am not smart i i'm i'm google smart uh, let's, there let's you go. I like having, it. having a wife studying medicine you're like uh yeah you start to learn how smart you are real fast. <laughs> exactly. I, I am not that smart 
There you go. Well, <laughs> that, that one, that one had made me think for a second. So I appreciate the, uh, the help, like, the assist. It, the slow burn is good. The slow yeah, burn is for good. Sure, for sure. Awesome. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> let's see, Christine says, uh, oh dear, I had to laugh at that as, as an intelligent one. See, there you go. That's winning right there. The show, the show, I mean, Jeremy is awesome. I can't wait to bring him in, but I already feel like a deep sense of, you know, winning right now. Cause I made Christine <laughs> laugh at a dad joke. She, doesn't, <laughs> she, she never laughs at dad jokes. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. There you go. You, you won. There you go. <laughs> no, I like the other comment. I have to bring, bring this one in. Sorry, man. Okay. That's all Kevin. Right. Kevin says, uh, it's, is it bad when you don't realize you're in the middle of the dad joke? <laughs> it's like, no, that was the point. And, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I like it. All right. Well, uh, Eric, let's, let's keep rolling. Let's get, uh, yes. get the, some housekeeping stuff out of the way and then we'll get Jeremy in here. Absolutely. Uh, and before we dive in, I want to thank you Everybody who's checking out Two Really Guys podcast, thanks for coming in. We're always looking for new guests, however. So if you or anyone you know would like to join us, please go to Calendly.com slash two, the number two regular guys with your show <laughs> ideas. Hey, hey, Terry's not here. Somebody's got to do the number yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast version of our show, we would appreciate you sharing the two regular guys with your industry friends so they can become regulators too. We would love and appreciate you giving us a review anywhere that we are located for your podcast enjoyment, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Amazon Podcasts, anywhere you listen to podcasts, please do those reviews. It means a lot to us. And if you're watching us live right now, please join in with the comments and questions. Uh, reach out to your industry friends and let us let them know to join us today, too, because we've got awesome info for you. Yeah, definitely. Make sure that uh, you share. Um, and then, Eric, before we get there. I wanted to share something going on with my company over there at our nice. success group. We've got a new webinar actually coming up uh, next week on April 14th at 1 p.m. Central time. In fact, let me get the uh, banner up if you want to go check that out. Um, awesome. So this webinar is happening next week. It's called How to Be a Goal Getter, Setting Goals You Will Achieve. So here's the deal, Eric. Goal setting is one of the most important skills a business owner can have, yet it was never something that we were taught in school. You know, and we all have goals, whether we admit it or not, you know, sales <laughs> goals or personal goals or whatever. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this opportunity next next Wednesday, April 14th at 1 p.m. We want to share with you how to set goals you will achieve. And then we're even going to give you a process that you can follow to actually then be able to achieve that goal. So if you want to sign up, totally free webinar happening. If you want to just sign up, it's our success group dot com forward slash goal getter g e t t e r so um please uh check that out um and we appreciate you guys uh interest in that i'm excited to hear about that i mean we anybody who's tuned in with, with all that you've done for business planning i can't wait to see about goal settings i think that's something like like i said i think that people don't have a format for it and you're completely right where yeah. people, we're taught to dream about things. We're taught to say what we want to do. I don't think we actually get down to setting goals and making actionable steps. And I think that's something that we all need a little more refreshing around. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to give the regulators a little tip here. Most of us, when we think we have a goal, it's actually just a wish or a dream. So we're going to we're gonna dig into what an actual goal is. So um, <laughs> thank you, Christine. <laughs> goal getter, a clever name. All right. <laughs> See, I'm clicking buttons. Yeah, I, it's like this is always your quote. I don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah, the, the Will, Will Ferrell thing, man. It's yeah, I can't help it. It's so You've hard done it for to go too long. Yeah, the production is something that gets into you. You start. <laughs> I wanted like I'm doing banners. I want to post links. I'm, it's killing me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep it going. You're doing great. So, um, Todd says free training and free gifts are always good too. So there you go. Super nice. Super nice. Yeah, yeah. All right, Eric. I am going to get out of the way here. So uh, the floor is yours. Why don't you bring in our guest and and I'll get Jeremy in in with you here in just a second. Absolutely. Uh, with that, let's definitely bring on somebody who's got a little more style than the two of us <laughs> to shake things up and help you folks get a little bit of the way you think about decoration shake it up. Because I think that we have a lot to cover here. Uh, Jeremy Picker is a creative director and CEO at Amber Creative, a Colorado-based merchandise design firm with over 20 years of experience in the fashion industry. Uh, Jeremy has helped launch and grow merchandise from major label brands and is passionate about creating retail quality merchandise for the nonprofit sector to fuel fundraising efforts and expand awareness. His client list spans from churches to restaurants to corporations, and he designs apparel for Podswag, the merch side of SiriusXM, Stitcher, and Earwolf. 
doing work for some of the most popular podcasts, including Conan O'Brien's, Office Ladies, LeVar Burton's, Bill Nye's, and more. Uh, Jeremy is also a cancer survivor and a co-founder of Estain, a high-end accessory line to support cancer education. So uh, honestly, I cannot wait to bring you in. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Eric, thanks so much, man. So excited to be here. Thanks for Aaron and Terry uh, allowing you to take over to bring me <laughs> on. So thanks so much. We have been planning this a long time, having a discussion, man. So I, I'm glad yes. that we could do it this right. way. Maybe, uh, I mean, Terry, we don't know if he's glad or not of me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but hey, I'm glad to have you on. <laughs> thanks, man. All right. So the first thing I just want to get to the title, because this is your title, by the way, everybody who does not know, Jeremy came up with the title of the show that I, I posted. So the title was From Logo to Luxury. And I, I love that concept already. I was just like, because I know so much about and have been following the stuff that you do and the stuff you put out there. Before we geek out on just detail stuff, what does that kind of mean to you? Like, what do we usually see in the decoration world and what would you want to see? Yeah, good question. You know, I think going from logo to luxury has a few meetings and part of it i came off the cuff you know as we were doing some brainstorming but you know i think logo to apparel by itself outside of like it being an actual clothing brand that's being your core business it's it's essentially a uniform you know i think yeah. there's nothing wrong with that but to go from like a, a logo to lifestyle apparel and that's that's something i talk about you know logos always kind of foundational you, you need that logo to wear but then when if you're creating retail product or if you're creating something that you actually want people to wear you need to step into that lifestyle realm so it needs to be more than a logo slap really because no one cares about your logo yeah. you know some people are so tied to their logo but we're so desensitized that just leading with your logo i don't i don't think has enough impact and how many logo shirts from a, a company, a nonprofit, a restaurant does anyone want to have? You know, again, you're not a Nike, you're not an Under Armour. And so people get so attached to their logo, but at the end of the day, it's it's basically a uniform. And so that's why I hear a lot of people don't wear our shirts, you know, outside of the event or you know, they never see the light of day is because, well, they don't care about the logo. They want something <laughs> that resonates with their lifestyle, with who they are, with what they support. So, you know, that's kind of one aspect. I think, why are people attracted to retail brands? You know, yeah. I think, is it the comfort? Is it design? Is it the decoration? Is it all of it? You know, I think when I'm saying luxury, it's not like, oh, high end, you yeah. know, Louis Vuitton, Gucci style. It's just more I think what makes people spend so much money on that, yes, it's part brand, it's part that ex exclusivity, but I think it goes more into the actual, the small details of the product, you know, the care involved, you know, that they've thought through a lot of things. And so, you know, some of the brands that I admire, you know, Ralph Lauren, mm -hmm. Super Dry, um, you know, and then Louis Vuitton does a great job, but like, sure. what are those little tiny things that, that makes the wearer enjoy it. And so from logo to, to luxury, that's just more, how can we create that lifestyle apparel that has a longer shelf life that doesn't end up in the thrift stores. Um, and you know, that, that sparks, if, if it's a, if it's a nonprofit, how does it grow your cause? If it's a yeah. restaurant, how do you get more patrons and how do you build that community? So I think that, that is your first question. Again, it's it, it was more off the cuff, but it's that lifestyle driven and going yeah. beyond the logo. And then I think a lot of stuff I see in the decoration space, you know, I can't completely knock it. There's there's a lot of great shops, a lot of great printers that is trying to elevate, you know, they're they're trying to step away from just a manufacturing mentality to how can we make a better product for our customer? And that includes you know, design development. Um, but the majority of things, you know, it is that thick logo slap, badly placed, <laughs> no imagination. Um, and the reason I'm so passionate about it, and I, I might sound a bit snobby, but it, I feel like we're, we are in a creative space, but yeah. people choose not to be creative, even if they are, you know, they, they are focusing on certain things that, yeah, keeping your lights on, you know, you need sure. volume, but how do you go deeper with clients? How do you help them make a better product, which in turn secures, 
you know, that business for you. So I see a lot of forgettable pieces, you know, that that's going to end up in the trash and the thrift store, which I call the t-shirt graveyard. Um, I, I like that t-shirt graveyard because I use it sure. as inspiration, but <laughs> uh, I love not that. all of it. I, I see a lot of uh, shirts that have sponsor logos in the back. Yeah. You know, that goes straight to the straight to the bin. But well, I, I think, think that you, you've hit it on the head. I mean, when you talk about lifestyle and by the way, I have to say right now, um, like like Terry Combs always says, when you hear a really good thing, you credit someone once and it's yours forever thereafter. Um, you're getting at least one credit for logo slap, but boy, I'm going to say that again because that is exactly what people do. They're like, I'm going to grab all these different garments and we're going to take the logo and in the same placements that we always put it, the same logo, no alteration, often without the right color changes, even to do like reversals on darks or stuff like that. Just mm -hmm. slap, slap, slap on every single piece at roughly at the same size, especially in embroidery, because they don't want to do more multiple files. Um, yeah. And it does. It, it reduces things. It, it, it makes you a commodity. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you can't be a consultant. You're a commodity. All you do is say, I, here's a logo. Here's a here's apparel. I'm going to slap these things together. And that's it. I don't think that I, I think that we are all we all have the equipment to make really cool stuff. We just don't go beyond it. And and in yeah. my experience. We are talking about like restaurants. We're talking about, uh, heck, even I worked for uh, big hospital chains and the stuff that that kept us going, we had people spending money out of their own pockets on corporate apparel because we had lifestyle, retail styled apparel in that category that we got cleared with their departments, you know? Mommy? Yeah. Sorry, my kid. Ow. No worries. Please go. <laughs> um, and, and, and to kind of build, you know, off of that, I think. Yeah. I think the reason people gravitate towards that is because there's not enough education or people aren't seeking education to learn more about how to elevate that. So a lot of it, yeah. it's not that they don't want to, they might want to, they just might not have the know-how or they might have, they ha might haven't taken the time to educate themselves on the retail side of things. And so, sure. you know, the things that I think I want to see in our industry is, how can we marry great manufacturing? Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people on your uh, on your take up love or they are embroiders. They are in the in the manufacturing space. But then, how do you marry it with great design and then development? You know, one a design is good enough, but I think the the perfect garment is all based on design, product, and then the, in the decoration. And so whether it's, you know, internal and you have the resources to do it in house or you're, you're partnering with either distributors or, or merchandise firms, how can you work with each other to elevate that for that client? Because again, reorders, um, when you hear, yeah. Oh, people love our shirts, you know, they keep coming back. We sold out a lot of times we never get that feedback because they have leftover inventory, you know, people aren't stoked about it. They're not going to wear it after, you know, said event or, uh, or, you know, conference. And so I think I want, I want people to care more, I think, and take pride of, of what we do as an industry, because no one needs another t-shirt. No one needs another hat. No one needs another bag. And so what is going to spark people to not only purchase, or if it, if they're given that to use it and wear it. And so I, I really want to spark people again. I might sound a bit snobby, which I am on on certain aspects, but it's just because I'm passionate about it and I see the value that it can bring. Again, over the years, people coming back and saying, I, I still have that sweatshirt, I still have that shirt. And that 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 sustainability aspect, not eco, but that yeah. that longer shelf life, I think is is beneficial to any corporation, any organization. Um, because they're getting just free impressions with with good merchandise. If it's not good, no one's going to see it. Oh, 100%. And I'll tell you, the one thing I, I see repeatedly that gets me crazy on this one is when you put the plain logo wear on all of your employees and then the exact employee sh shirt is what you try and sell as a retail product in the front case. <laughs> and it... It never moves. Very few people buy it. There's only so many super fans of your local diner. Like there's only so many exactly. people if you don't have anything yeah. more than that. So I, I, I'm I'm on board Completely 100%. Agree. So I hate to say like I might be a little snobby too. People sometimes will accuse me of that. What I will say though is like, especially now I, I mean, we're going to talk about embroidery and applique because we want to get into the nuts and bolts. But sure. you're doing digital print 
once the design phase is done, the execution, a lot of people are doing digital print. It's not, you know, it is not that much different. Once the design work's done, the execution is there. It's not, that's not going to cost you more. And a lot of people are in that space right now. I'm like, so the design work is the one place where we have to look at that. But I think that it's not as arcane as people maybe think it is. Yeah. And I think like little add-ons, I, I, I was on a webinar the other day talking about how can DTG shops offer more without like buying more equipment. And so I've been really pushing the, the heat, heat transfer of most DTG shops have a heat transfer mm -hmm. transfer machine. Yeah. Yeah. So how can you bring in unique heat transfers? How can you bring in, you know, woven, woven labels or woven heat transfers yes. in patches and chenille to kind of elevate that there's no more equipment needed. And if someone's coming to you and asking you, Hey, can you do this? Or I saw this on champion. If you're saying no, they're going to go elsewhere to find someone. And so how can you offer more in, in people are wanting these things. They just don't know it's possible. And so my goal, how can we get people in our industry to know more about these things to where it's not costing you any extra, you store some of these labels for your customer. And even if you are doing print on demand, you just set it up in your process to where you add that patch, that logo, whatever, and it really elevates the product versus just a printed, you know, t-shirt. So those are the things that I want to yeah. help people imagine and, and, and understand that it's available to them. Um, and they, they don't have to be a big shop. They can be doing it in their garage and still make, you know, quality, quality yeah. merchandise. The first edition to any embroidery shop, I always tell people heat press. 100% heat press. Like if you don't have one, you, yeah. you need one because it does it. It opens up a world. And even though sometimes things aren't as custom as having things explicitly designed, it does give you applique and rhinestone and all this other stuff that you can do without really increasing yeah. your equipment. But we have a couple of really good comments yeah. I want to bring in briefly before sure. I want to get, I still want to get into the applique and stuff. We're going to get there. It's all <laughs> We're going to get there. Real it's soon. all good. But here's a couple <laughs> of good comments we have. Uh, Brian Bailey, Creative and Brilliance, comes on saying, it's interesting that vintage workwear brands like Ben Davis still have following is everywhere. Um, fit and finish are important, but out of the decorator's control often. Do you see a move from the industry to provide goods like that to decorators? Like uh, Cuba Vera is what he brings up. Like, do you think branded wear or other stuff with higher fit and finish, do you think that's being a thing for decorators more or no? You mean like 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 a Carhartt like like retail brands that are now coming to our industry? Yeah. Is that what I think he's I mean, gathering? I think yeah, I, I think yeah, Carhartt for sure. I mean, I've I've seen a massive increase increase with Carhartt for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I you know Kodopaxi, you know they've recently yes. come in our industry. I mm -hmm. think, but I also did you see yesterday uh, Patagonia said they are pulling all of their apparel for logoed wear. They're not allowing to do the corporate wow. wear anymore because they think it minimizes the, the the shelf life of their product, which was very interesting. So while other brands are seeing the benefit of co-branding or opening up your garments um, into the you know decorated space, there's people pulling out of it. So I think I think more more people than not are going to catch on because you know retail is just getting more and more competitive. And if you open up to some of these, you know, companies in our industry, I mean, you're going to sell a, a lot more garments. And again, people, instead of going generic, they're going to say, all right, I want that Nike. I want that North Face. And they're going to pay. Plus, they're going to have their company brand on it. So I, I think it's just going to keep growing as retail brands catch on that these <laughs> brands that are in our industry. I mean, Cotopaxi is probably going to, just by bringing that into our industry, I mean, they're, they're going to grow immensely um, oh, yeah. in brand awareness and in revenue. Well, and I'll, I'll say on my part, I keep seeing more and more people kind of not only leaning there, but I've seen companies say that their, you know, their kind of retail style, their lifestyle gear is part of what makes their company like literally and i think you yeah. shared a, a video that was really interesting with that where there people are showing their gear their swag if you want to go there uh yep. as part of what makes their entire corporate culture what it is and why people want to be there with them and i was kind of yeah it's something that i never thought i'd see being that pr you know, prominent because i remember fighting for people to do that kind of stuff <laughs> exactly 
And uh, yeah, one more I'm comment. People from, are catching on. So that's. Oh, it. yeah, totally. Uh, one more comment from Christine Shreve, then we'll get on. Uh, she says, uh, I don't think it's snobbery. It's more of wanting to make things that people will want to wear and keep. It's not snobbery. It's just common sense. People don't want to buy your stuff. You have no revenue. Uh, yeah. Especially as Jeremy points out, like that, that return purchase. If you're coming up with new design cues and you're putting in front of them new options year to year, of course, people are going to be thinking you know, about what they could do with that style. Whereas you're like, hey, you're ready to reorder your polos? Yep. Come on. Like, what's what's the what's the draw there? Anyway, yeah. I, I, I this has been a bestseller for 10 years. Well, that's that's because you haven't done anything else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, all those people that bought that item. They want something new and fresh. They're not going to buy that item again. And that's, there's so many people that like, oh, this is our best seller. I'm like, well, refresh it a little bit, you know, yeah. bring it a little more modern, add a different colorway into that. You know, there's so many ways to, to change that best seller, you know, retail brands do it all the time. You know, they'll take their logo, but then they'll do unique fills based on, you know, florals trending. So they're going to put floral sure. patterns in their logo. So it's, you know, I think, I think it's just lazy that, oh, we're just going to keep it this way, uh, you know, versus let's let's push it and test test the water. So and that's the thing. It's like, it's coordinate, don't replicate people. You don't have to replicate your exact logo on every part of it on everything that's yeah. branded to bring out the brand. And uh, one more comment. I love this one from Javier, who does awesome TikToks, by the way, if you haven't seen on your TikToks. Yes. Um, I just retired. TikTok. Oh, totally. I just retired six old polos with, I'm retired by the way. You just retired six old polos with uh, big left chest logos from my old company I was given, but I wear supplier headwear often that was tastefully decorated. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for making our point, man. <laughs> absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, in any case, I want to bring up some more of your work because honestly, this is why I wanted to bring you on because your work is something that I find very inspirational. Um, I've seen amazing pieces of yours that have that creative bent and especially having seen some of the stuff you've written about how your design process. I really love that. But a lot of them include like applique and multimedia. And I want to know what, why applique is a medium. What does that do for you? And let's talk about like fabric types. Like what do you use? Let's get into applique a little bit. Yeah. Well, thanks. That, uh, it's a, it's a subject, as you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I started my business or really my career on the production side of things, um, at a, a applique company that would do R and D for Hollister Abercrombie, um, professional sports teams back when Abercrombie and, in, in, uh, Hollister, and they were actually doing applique, but not so much <laughs> anymore. Um, but that's, that's how I learned. And, you know, I think, I've always been a fan of fabrics in, yeah. in my subconsciously. My mom was a seamstress. And so Mine I learned too. how to sew. <laughs> really awesome. I yeah, learned totally how to sew a garment before I could swing a hammer. You know, my, all my buddies, you know, they did whatever manly things, not that I, I better be careful, but that was just, people thought, you know, yeah. Oh, you're doing yeah. home ec, you know, and I liked home ec over shop. I, I really, I gravitated um, towards that. And so you know, I think I've always, I've always also loved vintage t-shirts. You know, yeah. it's something I, I used to go in my grandpa's closet and pull his, you know, Western buttons or snap button shirts. You know, I would go to the thrift store and just find old quirky designs. And so, you know, I think that's something that I've, I've been working on, you know, 30 years since I was, when, since I was young, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> since I was a teenager, yeah. but you know, I think I love, I love that, that, that natural wear and tear. And so, yeah. um, you know, for me, when I'm, when I'm trying to build a garment, I want to be as authentic as possible. You know, I don't want to just add a stop distress, distress texture on a screen print and call it vintage. I want to study these shirts that have been washed a thousand times, how the, the ink's peeling off, how there's little holes in the applique, um, you know, how there's, there's fading and sun damage. So like, I, I want to go very deep to make it look like it, it is from 20, 30 years ago. Um, but it's a modern, you know, replication. And so that's, you know, I think as, as a, a, a creative, you know, I'm also a business owner. That wasn't my first skill set. I kind of, <laughs> I started my business with a partner and then we, we split ways, um, 10 years ago, and so I had to become the business side of things, but 
the reason I got into it was my passion for the production and the fabrics and the colors. And so when I'm looking at something, I first go to what's going to be awesome. And then, you know, I have to dial it back based on <laughs> budgets, quantities, turn times. Um, you know, I'm a realist, but I also know that value that an applique or a multimedia or even just specialty ink, you know, yeah. something that the wearer is going to really enjoy. It's not necessarily for everyone else to see. It's what is going to make that wearer put that shirt on over something that they bought in the mall. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of, you know, when I'm when I'm starting, I, I want to think of that whole thing. How is it going to look on the retail shelf or on mm. the body and then kind of work my way back? That's awesome. No, and honestly, the texture of applique is something you can't you, know, you can't overestimate. Really, it's incredible what it can do for a garment. And honestly, as an embroiderer, I think that sometimes people will go, "Oh, it's the same. It's the same amount of work as if you were just stitched it in yourself." And I'm like, "I number one, no, it's not. <laughs> number two, <laughs> yeah, number one, no, it's not. The times do change with that stuff. And number yeah. two, the the amount of texture you can wring out of it, honestly, without as much work on say like the digitizing front." is spectacular like there yes there's there's work to be done in it but it's not the difficulty of it isn't what people think it is like the complexity it brings just because it's an applied material is a lot so i got i have to agree i know i'm not being interviewed so maybe i can shut no, up but no, no, <laughs> dude but you're dude, the expert I'm, man so you, yeah you make man, me bring all so your knowledge this well, no. And that's the thing is like, I geek so hard to look at your stuff because you really bring all that in. I mean, like what kind of fabric types do you like to use most? Like what's your go-to? Yeah. So that vintage kind of vibe. Now I, yeah. I like to do the sporty athletic vibe too. Um, yeah. you know, when, when, uh, requested, but just, you know, I think I love felt and I love like mm. brushed cotton twill or, or nice. a canvas. Um, you know, I think whether it's just a single layer or double layer, you know, I, I, I really gravitate towards like a felt base and then mm. and add uh, cotton twill on top. You know, there's, when you choke in that kind of tack down stitch, you, you leave that exposed edge and the edges will fray with the twill, but not with the felt. And so I love the way that looks as it curls up, it kind of reveals the color of the felt underneath. So um, those are really two fabrics that I love. And then, mm -hmm. you know, what other things can we bring in um, that's are that's super unique? So, you know, is it is it faux crocodile? Is it uh, carbon fiber, faux carbon mm -hmm. fiber? And, you know, I think the 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 creative side, again, it's not just a one trick pony. You can achieve any retail look just based on the fabric and the stitch type that you do. You know, the athletic, they have the zigzag or the satin stitch border with, mm -hmm. with uh, tackle twill, you know, and it fits that sporty look. And you can do the same design, you know, with a felt or a jersey or a cotton twill and, and, and achieve that vintage look. So, you know, those are my favorite. But I think anything that has to do with applique, I love. Uh Maybe not all fabrics, but most. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you think about the lifestyle of it too. I mean, the fact that, or not, not only just the lifestyle, I mean, the life cycle, the fact that as this thing washes, what is it going to look like? What is, is it going to retain something or even develop an interesting character is something that you don't get with every kind of decoration, you know? And I, I do yeah. love that. And I actually, I want to bring in something from Mona because you're talking about how we get all these different styles. She's got a great comment here. Um, yep. And your logo, your logo doesn't have to be static in the same logo on every item. Look at Coca-Cola. They have their logo and then dozens of variations. What I always tell people, I remember very early on looking at, it was like uh, DC. So it's like skate stuff. And yep. their logo on hats is just their logo on hats. And even though it was in the same position and size, it was all these different thread colors. They had different fills on everything. Some of them were printed, different underbills on the hat. But no, no one of them would you not say it's DC stuff. And in that case, even when I looked at it as the technical size and embroider, I'm like, oh, you know what? They didn't change the execution. All they changed was fabric and thread. And so on the machines, it was all running the same way, same needle, same everything. They were actually hadn't changed yeah. execution, but then you still can. I always tell people like, you already know if you have a sports team or something that you love, you don't get the same hat that's the same color with the same size logo on the front every single time. They don't, they don't have to do that and you wouldn't buy it. You got 15 versions of stuff. So I, I think it's great to say that. And with applique, I always feel like sometimes that texture comes, 
I don't want to say free because it sounds stupid to say that, but like the shape, the surrounding shape of the applicator, the lettering is there. And so much of it is, like you say, it's born out in the fabrics and I love the idea of all the kind of cool touches, the carbon fiber, that kind of stuff, which is non, the non-standard stuff's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so you spoke a little bit about like um, stitch types and how that affects things too. And I would love to talk a little bit about interpretation, you know, uh, we talk about how we're coordinating looks. We're not just replicating logos, the logo slap, which by the way, brilliant. <laughs> but in the process of doing like embroidery and applique and on, honestly in anything you do, cause I've seen some of your great print work too. I feel like there's a lot we can do to change the character of a design, even what, depending on you know, the logo or the shape and that doesn't necessarily have to change. So what about that phase? What do you think about with uh, interpretation and even like specialty stitches or digitizing? Yeah, you know, I think I think it starts with knowing what the marketplace is doing. You know, I think most of our clients in this industry, they're they're not the ones that are building the trends. They're not starting the trends, you know. They are the ones that are influenced by, you know, high fashion down to down to casual wear and knowing what they're doing and what they're putting a lot of money into R and D to come up with that probably two years prior for a lot of brands. It, it, it boggles my mind that more people don't take notice of that. It's not just, Oh, well, I don't like that brand. It doesn't matter. See what they're doing. And so that's where I get a lot of that interpretation. I, I go to the mall. I find out some of those things that, you know, are common across different brands, across different retailers. And so, you know, the stitching and applique and the specialty ink, super dry, yeah. they're my favorite brand. They do applique, they do specialty inks, they do heat transfers. They basically, anything in our, you know, embellishment catalog, they, can, they, they do in their garments. And so, you know, I think being able to have that, that, that fashion approach but also, you know, sometimes you need that classic. You want that standard, you know, embroidery, you know, the 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 preppy style look. You know, I think it all depends on the 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 project and the customer mm -hmm. and then their demographic. But for me, I always try to approach things on a customer side versus technical. You know, I know you are the technical technical guru and the people that you're teaching on Fridays, they understand that lingo and, and the things sure. that you're bringing from a manufacturing. For me, I don't know that technical side. I know what I like visually and, and uh, I know a lot of ways to get there. But when it comes down to, you know, your needle types, you know, like all of that <laughs> stuff, I trust my partners with um, yeah. and let them bring their expertise. I don't want to dictate all of it. I want that collaboration. But for me, I, I want to make it digestible for my customers who aren't in the apparel world that mm. they do want something cool and great for their brand, but they don't, they're not going to dive in and understand the ins and outs. And they really don't care uh, from what I know. So I've kind of broken stitches down into three, three categories. So I have my foundation stitches, my fashion mm. stitches, and then my specialty stitches. And so again, found and you might have a, a different combination, but sure. for me, satin, satin stitch, fill stitches, you know, uh, a, a running stitch, a zigzag. I, that's kind of the foundation. That's that I feel like is some of the most popular stitches that people are using on everything. And so sure. I, I start with that, that, that you can build off of the, the fashion stitches. Again, this comes from what is what what are all the the retail brands doing whether it's current or you know 15 years ago when i started doing doing research and so you have your chain you know your faux chain stitch that yeah. you replicate right on 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 um the automatic machines not not just a chain stitch machine mm -hmm. you know you have your I, I really like the double and triple line bean stitch you know bean stitch being and you can correct me if I'm wrong for my <laughs> understanding, sure. you know, it's just a running stitch, but yeah. it, it has multiple passes within the same hole. So Absolutely. It, it gives that thicker look at, you know, that more hand sewn, um, like, you know, grandma, grandma mending your clothes. And then, yeah. you know, other stitches, loose whip stitch. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, I've, I just discovered a slanted bean stitch and it has a really cool, 
like angle to the stitch um yeah and been experiencing that and then the the specialty stitches and i know you can name a, a handful off of that but specialty just meaning unique i use like repair stitches to make it look like it's been mended but yeah. it's just in the it's just in the artwork you know if we if we break the fabric up to look like it tore we use those little repair stitches to make it look like it was sewn back and so those categorizing in those three stitches you know i try to guide my customers on this is going to be you know either the tack down stitch or um you know the fill stitch and then let's bring in something specialty based on the aesthetic that we're going after um and so that's just on that side and then on the applique side are you looking for you know clean and refined or are you looking for destroyed and vintage um or worn in and so depending on those categories you know are we going to use felt are we going to use mm -hmm. um you know the the synthetic material that's not going to fray um or you know the tackle tool where we want to have that satin stitch border or do we want to get vintage with it and really have that worn in frayed look that's going to age and curl and, and and you know kind of wash out over time and so again it's not just one way to do things it as a designer like i'm not a physical designer i'm more of a creative director and my uh my yeah. designer angelo really brings a lot of what i have to life and then he worked for a company that did uh, appliques as well so he knows on the design and production side and so when we're thinking of that it's always how can we make it easy for the customer because they don't need to know that there's a thousand stitches yeah, i sure. i want to narrow it down and then lead with our our experience you know i think too much in our industry we're not the we're not showing them our expertise we're not guiding them we're just taking their direction and most of our customers are novices so it's like we're taking direction just to have that path of least resistance versus hey we're gonna hold our customer's hand and help them make better buying decisions and totally. make them look more authentic and, and have that interest for their customers. That's awesome. I, mean, I love this concept you have where it's like, first we're, we're looking, and I mean, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, I think as we, if, if we get enough time, cause we got so much more to go over, but like we're talking about audience, uh, you start from audience and style and then say, okay, here's, here's materially what can happen. And then we have, like you say, these foundational stitches. And I know also that you used like specialty threads. I mean, the thumbnail we put up, you had like a spun polyester thread that had a little fuzz to it, but still runs very similar. <laughs> Check it out. That's spun poly, spun polyester threads. Cool. And honestly, this one's like, actually Bermelina, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, Ber Bermelana from the, India is a nice wool blend. Bermelana, yeah. And they also have Bermelana Co, a cotton blend. And it's, it, without necessarily changing the digitizing that much too. Because if you're somebody who is technical like me, I'm like, okay, I can make something for Bermelana by changing the density. And sometimes that's it. You know, it, there are certain considerations like small stitches, stuff like that. So if you, so what I love that you're working with people who have that interpretational skill on the material side, yeah. on the execution side, but you're bringing in style and the discussion with the customer to try and get that idea. I mean, too many times I've seen decorators, this is my pet peeve, slap a full catalog down without curating what garments are, are in it, then slap down the catalog of what they can do, a big book that says, here are the decoration styles I have, and then walk back and wait. Yep. They're, they're taking orders. They're not, they're not working with a customer. And I think that you leave Absolutely. a lot of value on the table if you're not being a consultant. So I, I love that kind of concept that you're bringing up there. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I guess actually, uh, Andrea says this very cleanly, uh, the types of thread can give it a cool texture. Newer thread finishes are amazing. The wool, the matte, the glitter and the metallic. Yeah. Matte. I've been using uh, matte when I play around myself too. A lot of the matte finish stuff is fun. Um, but how yeah. is that, how is that, is that difficult? I've, I've heard from some embroiders that it's a little difficult to sew down, you know, uh, this is what just I feel. experience for me, the, the matte finish threads run very well. It, they are thinner. They, they tell you it's a 40 weight thread. It runs like it's in between a 40 and a 60. So it's thin. I find that I have to increase my densities if I want coverage, which I know that's super technical stuff to know, but it means higher stitch counts. Um, and it means a little more density if you want to get full, full coverage. The thing is with matte finish threads or with like spun polyester, sometimes you don't want bulletproof full coverage. You want a little peak. Exactly. You want some of the ground to show through. And it's hard for an old school logo <laughs> digitizer who was told like, 
if it's white on black, well, I better not see any little bits of black garment <laughs> sticking through. That is yeah. a hard lesson to bring yourself to. And I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, the way I came to it before I saw stuff like the inspirational stuff you were doing, uh, came I came through with uh, home decor where I was like, man, they don't put stitches in home decor. Like it, it is, the fills are light. There is so mm -hmm. much of the garment coming through. And when I worked on some home decor projects, that stuff really turned my head around about how much stitching needs to be there for it to be embroidery. I was really like, and even though I was trying for a soft hand, even my soft hand is full coverage a lot of the time. You know, I'm, I'm really covering that material. And, and it's still soft. It's softer than most people, most people's work that I was working with for sure. But at the same time, it's, it, it is full coverage. I'm not using the material like you're talking about. And I love the idea of the repair stitches. So you've got like the foundational stuff that makes up logos. It makes up or complete full coverage on edges like you're talking about with the satin edge. But then yep. you have this second layer of decorative stuff of, of like mocking hand stitches or other head stitches. And then on top of it, you have that kind of style stuff like the repair stitches where yep. it is a design element unto itself. And that's, that is awesome. And by the way, no logo has repair stitches in it. So it's not going to be in the art guys. It's not going to yeah. be in the, yeah, the it, it will, it will go against the brand guidelines a hundred percent. And you know, and that's the, that's the hardest part of the people that are creating the brand guidelines. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I love branding and I do some of that, but it's, Apparel's meant to be worn. It it needs to have a different approach than all other mediums in a business, yeah. digital, print. Apparel needs to have its own guidelines, but it's not just do not go away from this lockup to the left here. You know, I, I really think that uh, branding agencies do a bad job of integrating apparel. One, they're not experts, but sure. they're not necessarily seeing that wearable they're just seeing it as a business card and you know that's why most co corporations don't have any fun is because they just take it too serious versus hey is there a way we can add our logo that is brand on brand secondary to mm -hmm. the focal point which is our mission which is the problem we solve which is our company culture and those are things again it's the education of some people want to do it, but you know, they have bosses that they have to, and you, we have to help them see the value of making something wearable versus a widget. No. And what I'm going to say is like, I know some people, and I, I get clapped back on all the time for, for getting creative because I've had people talk to me. It's like, ah, nobody cares about that. You know, Jane's plumbing isn't trying to make this elevated gear, but when I've offered elevated stuff to people, especially when I'm, like I said, there's some stuff like, using specialty thread and maybe changing densities on something where you're not actually totally recreating things. Um, I yeah. feel like they do take it up pretty readily. Um, how do you assess a company or a brand for that? Like what's the right audience for that creative work or how do you tailor your approach depending on the vibe that you're picking up from the company or the group that you're working with? Yeah. So, you know, me personally for, for my company, I think over the years, we've aligned ourselves uh, with a customer base that values the things that we value. They want to push the envelope. They want to have something that is retail worthy, even if it's a giveaway, even if it's an employee uniform. Um, they, they want to have something beyond the basics. And so I think naturally over the last 12 years, those the companies that were price driven, the, the companies that just wanted to make the apparel they've kind of weeded out themselves and the, the customers that we have built up in our core are the people that trust our creativity, that trust that we know what's on the cusp of, of trends and we can filter that into their, their business. And so the plumbing company doesn't need my services necessarily, but I, I think if they want to be unique, you know, there's some great ways that you can, bring a, a make a plumbing company cooler you know the just having i've seen that faux diamond plate uh fabric and instead of your joe schmo logo you can fill that with diamond plate and you know you can tie in the plumbing trucks in your industrial equipment into the garment and have have that kind of customer experience instead of everyone has a polo <laughs> with your logo on it or the print on back. And so I think, again, it's, it's aligning yourself with the people that value those things. At the end of the day, 
basic screen print, standard embroidery, that is going to be the majority one because of time. A lot of times, sure. um, and people, people don't care, but I want, I want to show people what they can have. And with my customers, it builds more credibility, whether they can afford applique or not. It shows that we know what we're doing. You know, we're not just, I'm not just showing inspiration and say, you do this. I'm leading with, this is what we've done. And this is yeah. why, you know, there's value. So I think it really, what's the focus of our customer base? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it that uniform that looks cohesive? And on brand, or is it going to be that lifestyle piece that, you know, people want their audience, their employees, their clients to wear in a social setting? You know, there's a big difference in a different approach. If I know that it's a, you know, giveaway shirt and they have a $4 budget, I'm not going to try to get them to do a patch <laughs> or specialty applique. It's just, yeah. it, it doesn't make sense. But for those people that have nicer budgets that can retail it or just want a nice gift, I, I like that applique because I know it's going to have a longer um, shelf life. And so, you know, I work with a lot of companies on the retail, like online and in store. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm also seeing tech companies, you know, if you go to CES, which is, you know, the huge trade show for all the tech companies, you're going to see an ocean of left chest, one color logos, screen printed or embroidery. Sure. All these companies are here to show our technologies, to show how <laughs> unique we are, and they all look the same. And so it's like tech companies have a great opportunity to say, my software is different than everyone else's. How can I make my company culture merchandise the same way? And I think you were referring to that post I did on Vivint, the yeah, yeah. home security company. Yeah. I mean, how boring is that? Home security, awesome. You know, like it's not, it's not amazing to even, like people don't even think about that, but they have put a whole department to creating incentives for their employees, you know, for their clients. And this merchandise is like better than a lot of retail brands I've seen because mm -hmm. they see the value. It's not just a cool shirt. It's about building brand. It's about creating that customer experience. It's about getting your employees excited. And so it's yeah. much more than just a garment it's part of, it should be part of the marketing strategy, a part of the digital strategy. Um, and then, you know, on the retail side, why are people going to spend their hard earned money on my, my coffee shop versus, you know, Billabong, Hurley, you know, H and M. Sure. Louis Vuitton, blah, blah, blah. Well, and, and I've seen you work on stuff for print where it's like, the, the part of it that was super creative or wasn't all that much cost base. I remember, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. It was a piece we're doing HD. Uh, like I think it was, it was puff or another high density ink, I believe. And where it's like, you redes yep. redesigned the logo. So it looks like tape or so that it looks like a material and the print wasn't materially that much more expensive than another classic print, but the design yep. work elevated it on the lead end. And it's like, it doesn't, even your per piece budget might be able to move a little bit for you just to have a cool design that doesn't look like the rest of your logo wear. So I think yeah. I, I kind of, when people clap back, I mean, oh, it's going to cost too much. I'm like, you know, not all the time. I think sometimes that execution yeah, it doesn't, have to. doesn't have to. I mean, I, the creative I see a lot of one color prints that look better mm -hmm. than an opaque full white print on any color, you know, doing a yeah. tonal, dark or a tonal light print, super subtle, really soft. It's actually cheaper because you're not even using an under base. And again, it's, you have to be able to have the time and you, most of us can't do that for all of our customers. Sure. We got to, how can we focus on our, you know, top 20%, give them that hand holding that, that development, but then also how can we educate the rest of our customers in a group setting? You know, is it a, a Facebook group? Is it the email newsletter? Is it, podcasts and webinars to show them what's possible to where you're not spending your time talking with every person showing them what's possible it's it's more of hey think it really is all just how, how to challenge people to think deeper and how mm -hmm. can i make this a better in product instead of the path of least resistance well, and that's what I love about the stuff that you're sharing. And maybe, I don't know if you want to bring up like some of the stuff you guys have done, that might be a way to handle that. Um, Cause certainly both yeah. in the fact that you do, you show a lot of that work you want to do. And then um, you also ha show kind of the research that you've done. And I think that's really important to what we got going on here. And I think um, yeah, Aaron, yeah. Aaron popped pop that, that up. up. Here's the, re the research side of it. 
Yes. Um, since we talk about trying to know what is out there, um, the fact that you put time into research and kind of show people what this is, this is your Pinterest page. You can see that building this, what I always say is, or at least this is kind of how, how I break it down for my other viewers, my take up viewers, as you say, um, yeah. is that you consume broadly and then you create with focus once you know what people need. Right. And I think yeah. that's something you're doing in an awesome fashion. And then um, maybe if I can have Aaron have you switch over to the other tab here real quick. Um, the other thing is you're right. you're consistently like showing. Uh, I think the other one one more time, because you're, you're showing the work you that you guys do, but you're showing the kind of work that's available. And in showing the work you want to do, you give people the, the kind of the license to ask for that work. I mean, people aren't always thinking about this ahead of time, but once they see it, they don't have. I mean, the creative work that they want to do is at least possible to them. Yeah, yeah, and I think again, it's it's not just searching on Pinterest or Google for that project of inspiration. Okay. I need to go find something to inspire. It, it, again, this is my philosophy. It's also my hobby. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing it no matter what, but I've built this up over 12 years because I, I call it my inspiration vault. You know, Pinterest mm -hmm. has created the platform and I'm milking it for whatever <laughs> will further my career and my passion. So, all, I mean, look at all of these. It's so diverse. You have your streetwear, you have your vintage, mm -hmm. you know, you have your preppy. And so again, it, it helps you think beyond just your customer's logo. It's here's the marketplace. What is the marketplace creating? How can we adapt our customer's style to some of these items to elevate it? You know, instead of a, a big screen print on the front and on the back, can we do just a little one layer applique that gives interest on the left chest, you know? And yeah. again, it's, it's thinking through that, but in order to do that, you have to know what's out there. You have to know what other brands are doing. Um, and so this is, I mean, this is just my applique. The other one he showed is just specialty inks, you know, yeah. crackle, um, you know, water-based HD there's over there that uh, iridescent, that's a heat transfer. And again, yeah. You could do that if you have a DTG shop. You can get one of those iridescent heat transfers that are really big in the streetwear right now or activewear, and you can add that to a garment. It doesn't even have to be DTG. You can just do a, a, a nice heat transfer. And I can't believe I'm saying that because I've always hated heat transfers, but they've come a long way. The, long, the yeah. longevity, the wash life, it's get, gotten so much better. And so... For me, I want to know everything possible with decoration, and I've been opening my eyes. COVID really opened my eyes to a lot of things. I never wanted DTG. I never wanted sublimation. I never wanted heat transfers, and here I am talking about it. And so um, you can teach an old dog <laughs> new tricks, and so hopefully <laughs> someone out there uh, can be, you know, be motivated to, to try to push further and try to create more value versus just price-driven Oh, no. And I, I think that's part of the thing. It's like we have to show ourselves the work. So we kind of have that bank. Like you say, that vault is is super important. Yep. And then I would say on top of it, showing your work and what's capable, as you said, not everybody's going to do this work, but it, it develops you as the consultant, as the expert, so that when they come to they, they need someone. Everybody's got want to want wants to have the guy or the girl or the whoever who they, they want to have their source. I know someone yep. who can do this if you're the person showing that kind of work, they're not going to doubt for a minute that you can do a standard left chest. I mean, I they're not going to doubt for a minute that you can handle yep. their brand. If you're showing that kind of work, we have a couple of uh, comments I'd like to bring in while, sure. while we have uh, this going on. First, we have a question. Um, actually, I love this from Aaron's. It's Aaron's watching. I love it. I'm just going to put this, con this is good. Yeah. A couple minutes here. Jeremy's thinking this does at such a high level and inspiration for all of us to raise our standards. So cool. Happy to be a regulator today and take this all in. So th thank you for working behind Thanks, the boards, Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, Brian okay. asks, um, mixed media printing DTG with embroidery over and around it is an amazing combination, but you don't see it often enough. Do you see that yeah. uh, coming up or do you recommend it? Yeah. I mean, so it's tough if you only do a certain aspect in house, you know, for me, mm. I've never been on that manufacturing side. So my agency, I've always outsourced everything. And when I first started, I had a person for embroidery. I had a person for screen printing and I would have to get that print 
shipped over to the embroiderer. The embroiderer would have to embroider it, you know, and logistically it's, it's unless you have that time, it's hard to do. If you do both in house, you should be offering that way more often because you can do a one color tonal print in the back or, you know, it doesn't even have to be tonal. You can just do a graphic that's full chest and then take it over to the embroidery shop and add some cool little stitch work over it. And now this, the, the customer can not only retail it for more, it just shows that, wow, there's multi levels. There's, there's depth to the design. And I think, I think if you can, you should, I, I think I also told you, uh, um, I think it was the other day is that all because you can, doesn't mean you should as well. Like yeah, it's true, it's all true. because you can do puff ink or embroidery or applique doesn't mean it fits. Doesn't mean, you know, I've sold customers expensive garments just because I wanted to push the creative. And that was, that was just my immaturity of, I want to do what's cool. I don't care about what, what they have <laughs> to sell it at, but then they would be stuck with inventory and they wouldn't come back. And so I've had to learn to refine that of all because you can, you need to know the time and place. It's mm. a great add on to the, the rest of your merchandise mix. You know, you need to have some of the lower cost driven stuff to have margins or just to not shell out too much money, but then having those special pieces, your true fans, your, your, your people that really love what you're creating, they're the ones that are going to want that and pay that extra, pay that extra for it. So, you know, I want to do screen print or, you know, multimedia even more than I do now, but you know, again, it's it takes more time. It adds more time to the, um, and then, you know, some other setup costs. But again, if, if certain volumes, right then it really doesn't add on a whole lot, but the, the perceived value of that garment is going to go up two, three, three fold. Oh and yeah. And I, I think the other thing people don't realize is within the same company, within the same customer, you may have a, a need for a smaller range of like high end stuff for one purpose within the company or within the retail, but other stuff that's lower end. And you can just work with coordinating that as a collection. I, I, I mean, we've done that many times in places that I've worked where it's like, yeah, we have a certain group of people who are getting immense perks that we want to have this extra, you know, crazy garment stuff going on. We're going to spend on yeah. that, but we're not splashing quite that hard for other things that we're doing or for giving sure. shirts. And that's still cool. Yep. All right. Well, I, I think I have one more, if you can hang on for a little bit longer, the one last thing I'd love to get oh. to is, is like pricing. Cause we talked about this a little bit. Um, what do you think about how, elevating decoration, you know, can create more appeal and what it does for your ability and your pricing. Yeah. That, you know, again, the price is the driving force of our whole industry, you know, being the, the companies in our industry, you know, our margins are a lot slimmer than the brands we're creating for. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that price pricing structure is, is going to be different for everyone, but mm -hmm. it's, again, finding out the goals of a project and then kind of working yourself back. If it's a customer that's retailing and they want a hoodie, well, what are they selling their hoodies for? Well, maybe screen print hoodie they're selling for 40 bucks. Well, if they had an applicate hoodie, could they sell that for 50, $60? And so finding those things that, that if they're a, a brand that's a hundred percent on margins, it might be more difficult, especially if you have retailers that you have to sell yeah. wholesale. I don't recommend applique unless you know you're you're going through thousands of units and you can do it overseas where it actually makes financial sense. But it's those little things domestically. If you're retailing them, but your core business isn't apparel, if you have a product, if you have a service, if if your core business is one thing, but apparel is a supporting element, you have a lot more flexibility. You don't need sixty point margins on that. You know you yeah. can you want that brand aspect as well as the monetary value, but you can shell out an extra two to $3 per garment for that cool factor or for that unique factor of your business. You don't have to be like, I need to double, double my markup. You don't necessarily need to, if that's not your core brand, you want that, you want to help that extend your brand to support your core product. And so there's a lot, lot of ways to go about it. But again, it's stitch work. You're doing 10,000 stitches for some embroidery. Could I replace all that fill stitch with fabric? Yeah. Is it going to be a similar price? Is it going to be less? Or does it just create more 
um, more uh, aesthetic, I guess, you know, that, that is going to be creative and, and people are going to notice it more than just a normal embroidery like everyone else does. And so, um, you know, I think the approach is going to be different, but again, you have to have time to show your customers and, and, and be selective. Again, mm -hmm. you're, if you're always pushing them to the most expensive thing, they're going to think you're just trying to raise, you know, ramp up that invoice price. But if you're saying, how about instead of going with a, a premium hoodie this time, go with a mid range hoodie. So you have more in your budget for specialty decoration, yeah. because again, design is the first thing they look at. If they can't get past if they don't like that design, they're not going to know how soft that garment is or mm. how well it fits. So how do you pull them in on the design side of things? And then as they get to it, oh, that's interesting. You know, it has a tactile feel. Mm. It has depth. It's not just flat. And so I'm probably going off and we could go another hour. With <laughs> <all of them. laughs> no, um, I think I think it makes sense. I, I think the other thing you brought up that actually we came on earlier, and I think that this is important to remember guys, we're often doing this promotionally. And if this is promotional, if this is marketing, then they need to not think of this as a cost that's just for, you know, that's just for garments or for uniforms. They need to think of this as marketing budget. They need to think of this as promotion budget. Yeah. They need to think of this as incentivization for customers. And if that's their goal and we're helping them reach that goal, that's that we're good. We're on, we're on for that. You're right. It's a very different thing when you're doing stuff for like a retail brand or uh, I know I've sold into like uh, department stores and stuff, which by the way, horror of all horrors, sometimes selling into department yeah. stores and, yeah. and res, it can be hard. That, that's a very different world. And it's a very different kind of decoration, but we're talking about stuff that's promotional. If we're getting yeah. eyes on people, eyes on brand, if we're getting developing top of mind awareness for the brand, that's a different kind of budget. And it should be coming from a different place sometimes. It should you know? be. Yeah. yeah. And I think, again, we have to show them. We can't just expect yeah. them to learn this. And the digital strategy, like you're talking about, when you go to Google or Facebook ads, the cost per click is what it is. All right. I'm going to put in $1,000. My cost per click is 15 cents, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. That's You can actually have data that shows the whole supply chain or the whole supply chain, the whole funnel of yeah. this, 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 and this apparel. No one looks at apparel cost per anything. The cost mm. per impression, your cheap shirt that costs $4 worn one time and ends up in the closet. Mm. It, the cost per impression is $4 for that mm. one impression. Totally. When you get a garment that people wear over time, that cost that twenty dollar garment worn a hundred times. You know what I mean? It's like that is something that that pay per click that ads can't even compare to because you yeah. now have a tactile product, and every time that person wears it, your company is getting eyes on it, just like nice. a digital strategy. Part of people just add doing ads in the Facebook pixels is just to get your their brand in front of you, whether you purchase them or not. It's to infiltrate your mind with their brand apparel. You're actually the customers paying you f for that 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 promotion that those impressions. So when you think of that, you have your retail focus, but you also have your digital strategy. And how can I bring apparel into my marketing strategy? So yeah. people don't think about that enough and it needs to be because it's a physical product that people will actually promote for you and you don't have to pay them a dime after that first initial transaction, whether you give it to them or whether they buy it. I'll say for everybody who's told me, oh, it doesn't matter now that we're all doing Zoom meetings and stuff. Uh, how many people have seen what's on Jeremy's shirt? How if, if I were currently selling space on my hat right now, how many thousands of times would that have been seen by now? Uh, you Absolutely. know, it, it's people are still appearing in apparel or having we've talked about the drinkware. Our drinkware has logos on it when we're on screen pretty frequently. We've got that in front yeah. of us all the time. So I think that's totally valid, man. So I, I know we've kept you a little extra. What I would love to do is kind of bring it, bring in a little bit more about Amber. Like what, what new directions yeah. are you going in? What are you doing now? And, and maybe eventually here, how can we find you so people can know more about what you're doing? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, for Amber, we're, we're, we're super small. Um, you know, my skill set isn't necessarily scaling a company. I've, I've come to find that out. Um, you know, I'm, 
I think we've created this boutique agency type of feel, but I also like it because we get to be a little more selective. You know, I used to take any and every project and it just, you know, ran me ragged and, you know, stressed out all the time. And then, you know, people don't value you as much as you, you know, (laughs) let that one time order, you can only have so much of an impact. I want to align myself with people that, again, that, see the value of apparel and merchandise that that appreciate our creative expertise mm. and customer service um you know and so for amber we're we're actually last year you know it was a rough year it was it we we went down six percent overnight just because of the type of mm. clients that we have yeah. and we would take anything and everything now you know we also have a smaller company than we did then. So for me, it's like, what, why am I scaling? And I've come to that, that, um, that pinnacle of is, am I scaling just cause that's what you do with business? You know, is mm-hmm. that what you're supposed to do? Get more employees, get more clients, put more money into it. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think that's for me. So for Amber, we're just trying to focus on clients that we can go deeper with that mm-hmm. are, what we bring to the table impacts their bottom line and they see it and their customers see it and they come to us and it's that partnership. I don't want to be a printer or a manufacturer, even though I'm not doing it in house, I'm the facilitator. I w I want to have that partnership that they are busy. They are experts at these things. And then they rely on partners like me that know in, and bring value to their company. So for Amber, you know, that's what we're kind of focusing on and it's been going well, you know, we're, we're always going through some growing pains, but, um, you know, I'm starting to find the lane that, that we are is building clothing brands. We're really not even doing one-off events anymore or projects. Mm. It's developing full merchandise lines. And I like that because instead of working with 20 customers with one project, one item, we're working with one customer and doing 20 items. And that's cool. You know, the, the project management is really uh, a lot more streamlined on that. And so, you know, for us, I'm LinkedIn is, is where I, pr- I put most of my content, you know, mm-hmm. I think I used to be very cl- close minded and like not wanting to share any of my experience or, or philosophy. Cause I thought, Oh, a cus- you know, a competitor is going to take it and they're going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to do this and that. And that, again, that's immaturity as I gr- grew up and understood mm. that one, not everyone's going to do it like me. I'm, I'm unique in what I do. Even if they know some of my special sauce, that doesn't mean they re- can replicate it. But at the end mm. of the day, what is my, what is my life goal? And that is to help people make better merchandise. Awesome. Knowing I'm small, I can only help a, a, a small customer base. So mm-hmm. what I found in the last two years of posting content of how me and you got connected, it's if if I can help other people make – if I can help other people make help their customers make better merchandise, then I'm mm-hmm. happy because the person that is taking my content and it's resonating with, they know that I'm helping them. I'm not. I'm not trying to get their business. I'm not – you know, pitching something yet, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to bring value, you know, cause obviously we only have so much time in the day and I want right. to have a living, um, or I want to make a living, but really it's how can I help people to where we're keeping, sh- we're keeping merchandise out of the landfills. We're keeping nice. merchandise out of the thrift stores and we're just building, we're making our customers look better. And so, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, we had a podcast that we need to get going again called Ink and Thread. Um, and so, you know, for me, if you haven't, if you haven't been able to tell that I'm super passionate about this, and again, me and you could talk for until lunch and then through lunch and Absolutely. tonight for happy hour. But you know, it's 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 how can we take our expertise in and impact our industry for the better and. Um, again, we sound snobby in a lot of ways, but it's because we care and we know we, through experience, we, we've seen what brings value to the end customer and what mm-hmm. doesn't. And we want to help as many people as possible, you know, see that value and look at merchandise on a t- completely different way. That is so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm and both, 
I mean, that's awesome, man. I mean, thank you so much. You share so much about, uh, honestly, for sharing what you do everywhere. Because honestly, I follow you everywhere you're at and LinkedIn and everything else. Um, just by, uh, follow you and also uh, beg you for con contributions. If anybody sees it, I've got an article coming up where I'm going to show a lot of Jeremy's work because I, I love it so much. But um, I, I just love that it's really purpose-based and it's on brand what we're doing here in Decorators Community with two of the guys and everything. Uh, and I just yeah. can't appreciate that more. So uh, thank you for coming on. And like I said, yeah. let's, let's make it happen again sometime. <laughs> yeah, and, and hit us up. I mean, we're always willing to talk. And so if you if you have a project that you know you're you're trying to solve for a customer and you're you're hitting a creative wall, I mean, I'm I'm happy to point you in the right direction. I'm happy to give you some inspiration. Um, you know, because again, it's it's how how can we grow? There's enough business for all of us to be to be wealthy. Yeah. Um, but again, we have to bring that value. We have to lead. I like to lead with with design and creativity. If you, if you don't have in-house design, how can, how can you get in before your customer even submits the, the design and the logo? How can you give them insight of this is what's trending? This yeah. is what I see for your audience, you know, go beyond just that order and, and really be that partner that people need us to be. Awesome. So, totally inspiring stuff, man. So thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Catch you soon. All right. Eric, oh, man, can I be back? I, wow, yeah, come back, man! I come back. You got to save that, me. Like I, that was incredible. Like so I said much in good comments. stuff. Oh my uh, god, so inspiring. And he he made a comment there at the end. You know, if you can't tell that I'm passionate, yeah, Jeremy, we can tell that you're passionate. We <laughs> love that about you. So um, keep it up, man. Uh, I can't wait till you bring bring back the podcast. I know there's only so many hours in the day, but uh, if there's anything that uh, we here at Two Raider Guys can do to help and support that effort, please let us know. So thank you very much, Jeremy, for uh, for your time. Eric, great job, sir. Um, but you also brought a five things to the table. So uh, would you like I to did. add that yeah. for everybody? We'll do it fast since we have uh, uh, yet another show to do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Plenty for of it. time. Plenty of time. We're, we're good. Time. All right. Let's let's bring in five things. All right, folks. So this is five things, and this is actually inspired by the discussion with Jeremy in getting ready for this stuff. Uh, these are five things to remember for creative apparel decoration. Uh, number one. Uh, coordinate, don't just replicate. When we're talking about doing logos for people, it doesn't always have to be the entire logo with its slogan as it's repl replicated on their letterhead on every single item. Do coordinating pieces of the logo or other style cues. Uh, number two, let the medium do what it does best. We talked about applique and embroidery here a lot, but there's tons of things that different media are good at. Let it be what it is. Let there be qualities of the medium that inform the garment. Uh, three, apparel is a wearable. Make people want to wear it. And actually, there was a great comment that I'm bringing up on the five things. Uh, you can make someone's favorite t-shirt or you can make someone's shop rag. Thank you for that one. Uh, yeah, make people want to wear it. Uh, number four, remember your audience. This also is when we're talking about things like... Uh, where where we can have a higher end thing. Jeremy said it very clearly. You have to know what your audience is and whether or not they have the margins for it. Remember your audience and also in the style, remember your audience, the end user, the end viewer. And number five, something that Jeremy does very well, show the work you want to do because that's how they're going to understand what creative options are available. We got to let them know. And honestly, it also just makes you a subject matter expert so they trust you with everything. Awesome. That is a great five things. And uh, yes, very inspiring and, and uh, great because Jeremy got to bring a lot of that information to us. So um, yes. perfect. Eric, what uh, what do you have coming up here? Well, should we do a little bit for Terry? <laughs> I'm well, just telling... why, why don't you start and then uh, I'll come back and we'll, right. we'll hit Terry and... All right, I'll start up. Uh, first thing, we're about to do the half, which Aaron's going to talk about. But after that, we're going to have the take up today, 2.30 Mountain Time, uh, the only important time, as you know, Jeremy, also in Colorado. So thank you. Somebody <laughs> else with Mountain Time for once. 3.30, center of the universe time. So. I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> today, it's episode 61, and we're going to be talking about textures. How do we use uh, layering and materials to make textures? Uh, once again, inspired by a lot of the stuff that's going on today. Uh, and 
you guys may know, uh, the webinar now has a date. We're still working on the title and all this stuff for it. I'm a little behind on this. But um, May 8th, subject to change, we're going to be talking about small run patches and emblems. Uh, if you like creating and selling patches, you know you're going to like this. So uh, go to decorators.education slash DNLD, and we'll get that link in the comments here later, uh, to get in on that list and learn more as the details are coming. There, there will be a little free webinar ahead of time, and uh, as it firms up, we'll let you know more. There you go. I'm 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 not not as quick as you, but I, I did get it in there. So. <laughs> Thank you much, sir. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, sorry to uh, skip out of order there, Terry or Terry Eric. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I'm really struggling now. I, I got out of practice. But uh, speaking of Terry, though, uh, he's yeah. got the complete screen printing business course at Workhorse Products happening April 17th through the 18th, and then. Uh, I'll mention his class in Chicago, but as of right now, it's sold out. So May 22nd and 23rd, he's doing that same complete screen printing business course with Atlas Screen Supply. So that's sold out for that one. The next class in Chicago will be August 21st and 22nd. Mm -hmm. uh, but reach out to the folks over at Atlas Screen Supply and uh, get on the waiting list if you're interested in that. Uh, and you can also check out all the details and all the information about upcoming events and everything else at terrycombs.com. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we're 10 minutes away from the half. The, oh, man. <laughs> so it's uh, 30 minutes of Q&A. And, and this is the one time in Eric and I's life that uh, 30 minutes is 30 minutes. So we, we cut it off right at 30 minutes. No exceptions. We have a blast with it. But uh, just a, a wide open Q&A. And, and we really have a great time with that. In fact, it's... Uh, not don't don't tell Terry since he's not here. Well, I can talk about him, but uh, <laughs> it's actually the most fun program that I get to do now, Eric. So there you go. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, um, so where are we at here, Eric? I, you know, I, if we're closing out, let's go ahead and close out. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've come to the close of another show, and I have to thank Jeremy again. Thank you, Jeremy Picker of Amber Creative. That was a very inspiring and wonderful. Uh, hour and 15 minutes about that <laughs> we spent on the show and I really enjoyed it. And by the way, thank you to our producer for the day, Aaron Montgomery for manning the buttons like the old days. And uh, because he's not here and I, I'm a nice guy, thank you to Terry Combs for always being the talent and uh, bringing his immense expertise to the show. So we'll, the two regular guys will be back again next week. And and this irregular guy will be back behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a fantastic job, Eric. And uh, I, I, I don't want I don't want Jeremy to feel like we don't want to talk to him. It just uh, you know so because this is the second time he's been on the show with us, and uh, we were not on the show either time. You got to talk to him both times, <laughs> but I just we love what you guys kind of do together. That's and my fault. Come out, so Jeremy, nothing personal. I'd love to talk <laughs> to you too. So don't uh, don't take that the wrong no, way. You can, you can no. count that as Eric wanting to monopolize Jerry, Jeremy's time because we have fun geeking out. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. there you go. Yeah, I would kind of gloss over on some of the things. There were definitely things that he said today. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna have to look that up. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I'll get you the glossary, man. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So uh, next week, we're still working on so stay tuned. We've got something coming up, but we don't have it to announce just yet. But until then, uh, I'm Eric Campbell in for Terry Combs. He's Aaron Montgomery. And we are for today, the two regular guys. Here we go. We're out. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out our website at tworegularguys.com. That's the number two, regularguys.com. You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tworegularguys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash tworegularguys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, tworegularguys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.